Welcome to the WT FFF Special Series, brought to you by the Z and 3D print teams from HP, where your hosts, Tom and Tracy Hazard, explore the all about the what of 3D workflows from concept to print. Hey everybody, welcome back to WTFFF in this special series sponsored by HP and I'm Tom Hazard along with my co-host Tracy Hazard and today we've got a really interesting episode. I, I mean that sincerely. I think you're really going to like this, especially if you're anywhere in the education to engineering to design space and or social good space not, social good space right and even if you're not everybody can relate to the subject of this episode <laughs> let me just put it to you yeah. that way because we're going to talk about everybody pooping today no and when we are but not are. literally right i mean we're not going to actually talk about that side of it we're going to talk about what's being done to solve that and so i was lucky enough to be introduced to a woman named jasmine burton a couple of years ago as i was writing my column for ink magazine and i'm going to share that article with you because the article is how a young woman designer is changing the way the world poops her foundation and uh, company is called Wish for Wash. It's a combination, both nonprofit and for-profit arms. So it's got both within it. And it is just been, it, she fascinated me. And I first interviewed her because of the sort of the design process of it. The fact that she was using 3D printing in her prototype in an iteration process, not for the whole thing, but for parts and for starting to study whether or not the models were going to fit together and do things like that. So she's got various pieces of it that they'd use 3D printing over time. So that's how she came in front of my desk and and I just was fascinated by her program but I was more fascinated by her passion and excitement for this as a young woman designer just out of Georgia Tech. So um, let's tell you a little bit about Jasmine and then we'll, we'll get into the episode. Jasmine is a social inclusion and design specialist with a focus on gender equity, meaningful, youthful engagement and innovation in the water, sanitation and hygiene, which is what WASH stands for. So water, sanitation and hygiene and global health sectors in general. She is trained in product design and public health and is passionate about social justice and human rights. She has led iterative toilet innovation pilots and research across sub-Saharan Africa with a design thinking lens and in resettled refugee communities as the founder of Wish for Wash. It is a social impact organization that seeks to bring innovation to sanitation. Jasmine is the toilet accelerator manager and social inclusion lead at the Toilet Board Coalition. I didn't even know there was a Toilet Board Coalition. She's technical advisor for the gender equity startup Equilo on the board of directors for Planet Indonesia in order to help lead their wash and gender strategies, a design communications associate for women in global health, and a former consultant for gender, gender and women's health research organization Adathemis and International Planned Parenthood Foundation. As a 2018-2019 Women Deliver, uh, Women Deliver Young Leader. She spoke at the 2019 uh, conference about her work and vision for gender equity in the WASH sector. Jasmine identifies as a social impact designer who seeks to utilize design thinking and business acumen to build a more inclusive world. Wow, that's a heck of a bio. Well, that's, especially that's... for someone who's really, I mean, we're talking about within, within a that, the, within a decade of graduation, oh, right? Even it's like less. five, I mean, she's six years, the, something like that. Still a very early, early part of her career. And I think when you listen to this interview, you're going to be very impressed, not only with her as a, as a person and, you know, what she's accomplished in her short career thus far, but in all the detail of this project. It's really probably one of the more complete interviews we've ever done on WTFFF of a project and all the different aspects of a project that, and, and it's a project that touches so many different things. Right. Really. That's why we wanted to include this in the series. And we asked HP if it would be all right for us to add it to this special series, even though this is not a project that they have anything to do with, um, at least up until now, they may want to after this episode, but that's totally up to them. But, you know, it's, it, we wanted to include it because it's such a great example of the way the design process works. And now you can start to think about all the different aspects of the things we've been laying out in the series about, about sort of the social and global view of the world. World, the trends and COVID and, and just taking a view of what's going on there and then plugging in and saying, okay, well, how does education play a role in that? And we'll, you'll hear very clearly how that education plays a role with Jasmine in sort of exposing her to these things and then how it also has supported her too as she goes through the process of having a community. And then from there going into 
into that transitional manufacturing and all of those stages and rapid prototyping and all and designing and all the design process that you have to go through in the iterations and then going from there into this stage of market viability of bringing things to market and to moving into this now a manufacturing and uh, you know getting it finally out there to the market in a more viable business way and how they've had to transition their business over that course of that time as well so that's why we wanted to include it because i think it really sets a really nice end cap to understanding why everything we've laid before is so critically important to both making sure that the ecosystem is building up and supporting designers like jasmine and just supporting missions and businesses like hers as well let's listen to the interview with jasmine Jasmine, I'm so glad we could do this follow up with you. I, I'm I'm glad there's been so much progress that we have so much to talk about today. Yes, yeah, no, I'm so excited to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Um, yeah, and I know it's been a few years, and there's been a lot of changes and pivoting and growth. Uh, and I'm really excited to ch chat with you about it. Well, I want to catch our listeners up because they might have not have read the article, even though we already referred to to it, and it is linked in the blog post for this episode. But you know, they may not know where you came from. So tell us how Wish for Wash got started. Uh, so uh, Wish for Wash came out of uh, the Georgia Institute of Technology. Um, I was a freshman uh, where I was beginning my product design career, uh, learning about, you know, how, you know, prototyping, uh, creating products that could be cradle to grave. So uh, things that can, you know, uh, be decomposed in, in a way that, you know, is, is organic and natural and, and uh, doesn't, you know, take up a lot of space in a landfill. And for me, <laughs> learning about some of these processes and these ways of thinking was sort of a, a moment where I was like, you know, I want to be involved in the social impact design space. Like I want to design things that, you know, aren't going to be thrown away ultimately, or hopefully not for a long time. And so I, I really sort of started ch trying to find out like what that world looked like. Um, and kind of beyond that, um, I, you know, went to a, the Georgia Tech Women's Leadership Conference where I learned that over half the world doesn't have access to a safely managed toilet. Um, again, Which I was is shocking, right? Yeah, that, yeah, that, like that statistic right there. So when it was presented, was it just talking about social good and, and the sort of world economics? What was it that it was being presented in for you? Sure. Yeah. So um, uh, at, at this conference, when I learned about this issue, um, it was in the context of uh, gender equity, where it was kind of like women are disproportionately impacted by the fact that there's not toilets at schools. Girls drop out of school when they you know, are puberty age. Um, and it really sort of impacts their economic livelihood and you know, things that they can pursue for careers. And um, there's a lot of stigma that comes with it. And so for me, as you know, someone who had just started college, pursuing a product design career, I was like, this is an incredible opportunity to use my design skills in the social space to not only improve this you know, sanitation issue, but also enable or help enable women uh, for marginalized communities to you know, finish school and kind of you know, achieve their, their career potential. So that was sort of my aha moment. Uh, again, I was 18 um, and I <laughs> called my parents and I was like, I'm gonna design toilets. And they were like, what? what? <laughs> yeah, they were like, what? <laughs> okay. But you weren't alone actually, because the Gates Foundation and lots of others were, were starting to work on this as well around the world and sort of raise awareness of this issue. And so you were timed really well into that process. Now, I remember you won an award. Tell us about that. Yes, yeah. So again, um, I kind of realized this passion when I was 18. A few years later, when I was uh, entering my senior design capstone, um, I had the opportunity to work with three other incredible Georgia Tech women, um, engineers and different skill sets. And we had the opportunity to actually use our, our, our various skill sets to uh, make a prototype of a modular toilet that, were, that was intended for a refugee camp in northern Kenya. Um, so we did a bunch of interviews, we like did a bunch of research, we like prototyped in studio and we were like, great, like, you know, we got to do a cool toilet project. But then at the end of the semester, uh, we were invited to participate in the Georgia Tech Inventure Prize competition. Uh, and we ended up being the first all female team to win uh, the competition. And so uh, that was uh, $25,000 in a patent. Um, so we went from like foam prototype on stage pitching to uh, judges to being on the ground in Kenya, getting user feedback. In a refugee camp within four weeks so it with was like a, a 3d rapid, printed toilet rapid, right? <laughs> rapid right right you know that's that's i i love that that's what it, it it went to do like it would be so easy for you to have taken the money and gone let's build a website and we'll build a little mission around it and like that and we'll stay in nice in our comfortable homes here in, in georgia right you know and we'll just go from there instead you got went out in the field and said let's test this out let's check this thing out yes. um what did you find when you were out there 
Yeah, so it was one of the one of the most humbling experiences for me, at least professionally. Because I think, you know, when you create something and you're so passionate about it and you've done all this research, you're like, yes, of course people are gonna love it. And this is definitely gonna you know help solve problems um, and make things better. But when you put something in front of real people and get real feedback, you are immediately sort of humbled by different realities and worldviews and understandings. Um, and I think that was really um, incredible as a young designer, just to realize that it is important to get that user feedback and to have people try it. A lot of people that we talked to hadn't used toilets before or hadn't seen a toilet like we you know, were designing. So it was a lot of um, education and a lot of us listening and also figuring out ways how to talk about sanitation because it's not, it's not something that, you know, everyone, t I, I talk about it all the time, but not everyone else talks about it all the time. Uh, <laughs> Moms of toddlers talk about it all the time, let me yes. tell you, but you know, yeah, other than that, yeah, or potty training your dog, like we discovered yes. that one recently, right? But we don't, you're right, it's not a normal part of our language and our language is very different than they may be using in whatever region you're going into. So that's also, you know, something we have to consider because they obviously didn't have access that's like we do every single day at every rest stop everywhere at every mall and every store. So it's very yes. different for us. Yes, definitely. Well, you know, I'm thinking about that though. How did it inform your prototype? Like how, what did, when you took the feedback, what did you do with it? And how did you decide you were going to make some significant changes to it? Yeah. So when we were in Kenya, we were working with an organization called Sanivation um, and they basically turn human waste into briquettes for cooking. Um, and so it's this whole sort of circular approach, like how can we upcycle human waste into a, a useful end product, uh, particularly in resource constrained communities. Um, and there was a lot of things, you know, that they're still doing incredible work, but there was a lot of like opportunities to improve user touch points from the waste management side. So I think a lot of us, when we think about toilets, we think about just like, here's the seat that we sit on, but there's this whole back end system. Like where does the waste go? Like who manages the waste? What about their user experience? What about their, you know, dignity? Um, there's a lot of like uh, work right now around like uh, waste management service providers and um, plumbers in developing countries and kind of how do we just make that a dignified, you know, area of work for them or so that that's safe, right? And so I think those those were some learnings for us as well to be like, how can we, this is a toilet that's off grid that isn't connected to a sewer line. How do we make this back end experience something that, you know, is is contained but is also something that enables the waste management people to do their job um, effectively and efficiently in a, in a safe way for them too. Um, so that was a learning as well as, you know, just immediate feedback from people who actually sat on the toilet and used the toilet and they were like, you know, this is too tall or, you know, this isn't big enough or like, uh, so there was different <laughs> learnings over time once we sort of developed that rapport with the community where they were like, they started to feel comfortable kind of giving us that feedback about <laughs> toilets. Um, that took time in and of itself. I love that. Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, and you really bit off a huge task. I wonder if you really realized that when you're in school with this project. I mean, the passion is admirable. It is a worthy goal to go to help try to solve this problem. But you're in design school, right? Industrial design. You're, you're, you know, most of your fellow students, I'm sure, were all about the form, you know, of things. And you, you took something that the form is probably, well, I, I mean, I'm an industrial designer too. So yes, it's always important. But right. when you're dealing with a product like this, that's a system, right? I mean, it may not be the most important thing. I mean, was that, that must have been quite an experience for you to, to come to some of that realization. Yes. Yeah. No, I think, um, yes, I think it is. <laughs> It was sort of a drop in the bucket when we were like, we're just going to design a toilet. And then you realize, you know, it's not just a toilet. It's like, it is the system, but then it's also the culture around the system and uh, the stigmas and where it's placed in, you know, the, the community and who has access to it. And if, you know, beyond just the toilet, like, you know, is there a structure around it with walls and with lights? And so it becomes this whole bigger conversation that has like cascading implications. And I think, yeah, I had no idea at the time, but I mean, I think that's sort of why I've continued in this work because there's so many opportunities to integrate design and design thinking to make meaningful change and to include lots of different voices that are often not included when um, toilets are constructed or a lot of times in, in development work people will be like oh you know people are just you know pooping in a hole like let's just give them this bucket is better um, and it's like no but people still you know want to have a dignified experience and especially if they've seen sort of, you know, traditional Western toilets, there's a like a aspirational component too, which I don't think is oftentimes recognized. And I think design plays a big role in that. How can you create something that's affordable, but also something that's aspirational and some 
something that people often say is, you know, I want my in-laws to be able to use this. I want to feel like, you know, they're coming to my house and I have a nice toilet for them to use, which is, you know, that's true. Like, I don't, I don't know if we think about that often here, but it's like, if we have guests, like we want them to feel comfortable, safe and hygienic in our, in our home bathrooms probably. Right. And so that's, you know, a, a component that I think is sometimes missed, particularly in, in marginalized communities. Yeah. It, it makes your, your design you're working on, you you need to make it desirable. You have right. to, you know, people want this toilet. I don't know that I've often thought about <laughs> wanting a toilet, no. although I probably take it to my toilet for granted every day. No, no, you know, you is, start to think like, as you said, guest bathrooms, like I, like I would really like a toilet the next time we put a new one in that flushes for us because our daughters never flush. Like, it, you know, like these are the like cushy things we think about here in America, right? You know, it's a totally different thing of like, I don't have anywhere to go. Yes. You no, know, I, and I have to leave school because I can't, I, there's no toilet there. Like exactly. that's a, that's a totally different mindset and view. How hard was it for you and your team to put yourself in, in being able to think that way? Yeah. Um, I think, you know, I, I think like going through the research process and kind of submitting to the design thinking phase where we were like, we're doing all this research. We did a bunch of interviews. We talked with people all on the front end and we were like, we know as much as we can know now. But then once you're in front of, again, the real people and getting the real feedback, that reality, you just like learn so much just from seeing and listening to people. And I think there's also the nuance of like what people explicitly are saying and what they're you know not saying, but you can tell that they're saying, right? And so I think observing people and observing their behaviors, because people would sometimes be like, yes, we love the toilet. This is so great. But you could like obviously tell that they've never used it. or like, it And they're so like, <laughs> I don't know what to do with this thing yet. You know, this is so important, Jasmine. And I'm so glad you said that because I think it is a, it's a early designer, like when you're young and you're a designer and they put you into the position and they're like, oh, here's our research back we got from our market research. And you read this report and you have no understanding. And it's at the point when you finally get to observe that you see why that made no sense to you. And, exactly. and it is so critical to have designers involved in the observation process. We're big, big fans of that. Yeah, no, it's, <laughs> this is really admirable, you know, how you approach this and what you did. I'm interested to, to get to sort of the the other side of it that is, well, first of all, a excellent what, what we've heard so far that you've done and going there and, and really firsthand learning about the problem and the cultural issues, and I mean, on and on and on. At some point, you got to get to manufacturing something. And as you put it, it has to be a low cost alternative. So, wow. <laughs> yeah. And, and that's one of the things that Tracy and I have always done in our product design careers is we're, we're big proponents of you can't design in your office, you know, and get it all right. Now you've shown on the front end research side, problem solving side in spades, how valuable it is to get out there in, into the real world. It's equally important to get out there in the real world when it comes to how is it going to be manufactured. Yeah. Um, so I'm interested to hear about that transition from, you know, concept and research to prototype and then, you know, plans for going on to manufacturing. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So, um, I mean, I think, you know, like a lot of young designers and probably just people that create and like to make things, we were very keen on sort of making the, the thing that we thought was the solution at the beginning. Um, we had this whole, you know, contraption that had this manual bidet because we learned that, you know, some cultures prefer white, uh, washing rather than wiping and that's sort of the norm. And we were like, we have this manual bidet that operated like a super soaker, which was a little bit aggressive um, once we sort of got into the real world. Um, but I think, I think. PSI, I hear PSI coming to play here. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, I think we were always sort of um, making prototypes. We were doing like ergonomic studies, like we like did different mock-ups of like seats and had different different our friends and family sit on them to like measure you know have different butt sizes like we did all of this this kind of prototyping but i think when we were in in the field sort of this aspirational component as it relates to the product became a big realization for us as well like i know our original design the actual back end of the toilet was a little bit sleeker it was a little bit slimmer uh, but some of the users were like you know we want this we want the seat to be bigger um, because they were like we want we we want to be able to fill it out like th this this perception of being like 
you know, wealthy and having enough money so that you can eat a lot so that you can gain weight. Like that was sort of the train of thought where it's like, if you are like, if you have like a big backside, like you're sort of, you know, making it in society, which like, you know, in my head, I had not even like begun thinking. <laughs> no, we're worried right. about like, how do we trim it down? <laughs> so we're like, okay, like people want something larger um, because of this aspiration of like, you know, if you can fill it out, that means that you're sort of moving up in society. Um, that was a learning. I think in terms of the actual physical prototype, you know, we started off with, you know, a ton of like the foam, foam core prototypes. Um, and then when we actually went into the field, or, or I guess before beforehand, our concept, we wanted it to be made out of ceramic because that was all that we really knew. We were like, that, you know, that's what works here. It must be able to work there. You'll quickly learn that particularly in uh, marginalized communities in developing contexts, ceramic is not necessarily readily available. Um, so we were like, okay, let's use plastic. So we did ABS plastic. And for our first kind of production run, it was at Georgia Tech in the design shop in the basement. We had like a bunch of our peers <laughs> and teachers and we were just pulling ABS plastic over this, the mold that we created, uh, doing like thermoforming uh, manually. <laughs> um, and so that was our first like series um, because we were like, we need this to stack and we need to be able to ship this to the refugee camp. So that was sort of our pivot. Where so yeah, that you see transportation issues into your, in terms of your cost model too. So yes, yes. And I think that too, as a young designer, you have all these aspirations and goals and things, but then when money and like logistics come in, you're like, oh, like shipping is real. And like, this takes up a lot of space and like customs and being able to explain, <laughs> explain a toilet to, you know, someone at, you know, the, the border. How do we code this? Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> So I think th those were some learnings as well, just being able to like have the specs on hand so you can talk to someone and you're, not, you're like, you know, this isn't something strange, like this is a toilet that we're, you know, working with this organization. Um, so that was a learning that we actively sort of had as we uh, went through this process. Um, and it then sounds like you had a lot of help from the Georgia Tech community, though, that oh, yes. where they were coming in and advising material options and, and ways to make things. Was that the case for you? Yes, definitely. I would say um, between alumni, professors, fellow students, uh, we, uh, we were just so supported and continue to be supported by the Georgia Tech community, um, which it enables us to, to kind of have those learnings and um, also learn with some cushion um, and support. Um, so I think like in terms of like legal um, processes, um, like for the patent, we had a ton of, of support in, in terms of what you know, the actual steps, which, you know, is, there's so many, <laughs> and like, there's no way we would have been able to navigate. I, I want to touch on that in a minute, because this is one of Tom's favorite subject areas, so I want to touch on that in a minute, but let's get back to the, the transition into manufacturing. So, like, at what stage are you at right now in terms of, you know, having it on the manufacturable scale? Sure, so we're, we're at an interesting place where we've, we've proven that people like it, we've proven that it works. Um, we have a few kind of tweaks that we're making, because we want it to basically operate in any sort of waste management environment. So whether that's, you know, you're completely off grid, you're doing a compost toilet, or you're, you have a fully operating like sewer line and you wanna be able to connect to that. We want it to be able to sort of connect into any sort of waste management option. Well, that's a broad goal too. It's, you just, yes, you yes. keep adding challenges for yourself, Jasmine. <laughs> it's like a convertible <laughs> toilet. I love yeah. it. Yeah, so it is, it's, it's intended to be modular, which comes with a lot of challenges in terms of like pieces and like, yeah, like how, how they come together. Um, so we're still, like, that's the place where we're like, I think focusing a lot of our energy right now is because this sort of aspirational component of being able to increase your sanitation status over time has become like a big learning for us where people are like, maybe I can only afford, you know, this right now, but I wanna be able to improve over time. And there's not really a lot of options that enable people to do that. It's, you know, you sort of have to wait until you have like $5,000. And if you make 50 bucks a month, like you might not ever get there. Uh, but now I can see purchasing this toilet would, it, you know, when you achieve that goal, people have this fear of missing out, right? Of having that upgraded version. And if your toilet can be upgraded, they're not wasting their money. Eh, that's a little marketing coming There's a little smart here. strategy. I love that. That's really working for you. So now let's talk about the patent process because this is one of your favorites. So they have been on a very, so they won a patent as a part well, of the program. Well, they won what the, the assistance and cost of a patent maybe, right? Um, yes. Yeah. So we, um, Georgia Tech through the Inventure Prize, um, they, supported us in like writing it. And then we actually got, I mean, it took a year and a half, but, but by the time that happened, we ended up getting a patent for, for our original. That's patent. not oh, that long. You know what? You're Let me telling tell you. me from the time you filed to the time you got it was 18 months? Yes. 
that's uh, actually that's not unusual at all. No. I mean, we we have many many patents, and and eighteen. There was a time at which patents were taking a lot longer than that to be just get their first office action. So you're that anyway. That's, that's good not news. long. Yeah, and you should be thrilled. That, yeah. That's incredible, and that's like a testament to Georgia Tech for. Like, <laughs> for <laughs> yeah, you should be thrilled that you had good help on that. But you know, you know, just having the patents not enough, right? That's what you've discovered, right? Now you have to have business plans. You have strategies around that. Obviously, you have to have manufacturing, and now you need some capital too. So yeah. I understand you broke the sort of business up into two parts nonprofit and the for-profit. Why'd you do that? Yeah. So, um, we, you know, we started off as this toilet and we still are very much a toilet and we have this concept that we're still sort of finagling, but we all also realized that our value add was much broader than just a single product. And, uh, we started exploring, you know, kind of what, what was attracting partners to work with us, what was sort of attracting, um, opportunities for us to grow. And it really became clear that, you know, we, because of our deep roots at Georgia Tech and because of the, you know, our story coming out of undergrad, uh, we have like a ton of interest from like, uh, Georgia Tech college students, high school students, grad students that want to plug into this work. So we're, we're really, that, that's sort of the nonprofit side where we're really looking to help diversify and bring in more people into the, into the water sanitation and hygiene sector. Um, and it sounds like a, a youth engagement model too, which is really interesting. Yes. Yeah. And I mean, I think like we're, you know, the world has these sustainable development goals that the UN wants to achieve by 2030 um, for sanitation specifically. Uh, it was reported, I think, two years ago that the world is like drastically behind all the targets that we were trying to reach by 2030. And part of our model is like, you know, maybe if we bring in some new minds and some, you know, diverse thinkers from different sectors and, you know, young people from, you know, it could be high schoolers, like maybe that will help disrupt the status quo of how we're working as a sector. And maybe that'll help us innovate better and innovate more um, effectively and efficiently. I think um, as a designer, again, like design thinking has been such a disruptive concept in a lot of the ways that we've worked compared to traditional, you know, water sanitation and hygiene products where it's more, this has worked in the past, so let's scale up. This is what we know to be true, so let's scale up. And you spend millions of dollars on something that's not proven on the ground, <laughs> and then people abandon it, or, you know, the toilets are, be you know, they become glorified flower pots. Because people are like, I don't know what this is. I don't know <laughs> what to do with this. Well, you know, that's very interesting. Uh, sometimes, and I, we've experienced this a couple different times in our careers. Sometimes it takes completely fresh set of eyes to be able to reinvent a product right. that is so entrenched right. in cultures, in manufacturing. I mean, manufacturing will always resist change because they just want to manufacture what they know how to manufacture, what's easier for them to do. I, I can't tell you how many times at a manufacturer I, you know, have them say to me, well, we, we'd like to make this change. I was like, well, I know you'd like to, but we don't want to make that change. I say, oh, but this is easier. Yes, I understand it's easier, <laughs> but you want it to sell, don't you? Or, you know, you want it to be adopted or, you know, it could be a number of different reasons. Anyway, I'm, uh, this is some certain parts of your experience are, are refreshingly deja vu for me. Um, but, you know, I, I want to make sure we don't overlook, I mean, obviously this is a 3D printing podcast. I would love to hear, you mentioned about thermoforming ABS. So I wonder if we could take a little step back to yeah. that and thermoforming ABS over your, some of your original prototypes or samples makes perfect sense. I remember doing that myself in design school. So when did you decide that 3D printing might be advantageous as you continue to prototype and test? And I'm interested in, you know, some of the details there, what type of 3D printing did you use? Um, and, and, you know, share some of that experience with us as our, our listeners are probably very interested in that. Sure. Yeah. So um, coming out of um, our pilot in, in Kenya, um, we, you know, had all these learnings, we came back to the drawing board, we came back to Georgia Tech, and we, you know, made a lot of physical design changes based on the feedback that we received. And our immediate sort of next step was kind of how do, how do we rapidly and I guess in, in as cheap of a form as possible, kind of get this out in front of more people, uh, you know, to see if this is actually meeting um, the needs that we're thinking that they're meeting. Um, and you know, again, being in Atlanta, like we didn't have the resources to go back to, you know, the, the refugee camp. But there's a ton of resettled refugee communities within the U.S. that have, you know, diverse populations, diverse understandings. Um, and actually, there's some interesting nuances, particularly in 
the Georgia uh, resettled refugee communities with like using ceramic sit toilets and people standing on them because they're used to squatting and not necessarily understanding, you know, that that can break this toilet and then the toilets shatter. Um, so there was an opportunity where we sort of realized like maybe we can get some of this feedback here and kind of address some of the, the needs, you know, sanitation needs in the Atlanta area. So you can um, 3D print, prototype it, bring it, get some feedback, that part works, that doesn't work, and yes. bring it back. Yes. So were you doing it in pieces then? Yes, yeah, so in, in pieces, and then also we did a bunch of scale prototypes just to kind of see, again, as we started, move, started moving into this modular toilet concept, we were like, we wanted to see if they stacked the way that we thought that they would stack. Um, great, so great that, that was sort of, yeah, so that was us just sort of seeing if it, they, the, the system kind of worked the way that we thought it did, and then we would put out pieces in front of users and you know there's a number of challenges in terms of getting you know approvals <laughs> particularly working with with um, marginalized communities within the US so um, in, in terms of getting feedback you know there would be focus groups or uh, kind of you know just like here you know what is this like let's talk about this um, and kind of seeing if people react with react to it the way that we thought that they would if people sat on it the way that they thought that they would even if they're not actually using it um, because again, a lot of like protocols and protections in place, which definitely makes sense. Um, but just seeing if, if um, people A, understand that it's a toilet without us being like, this is a toilet. Um, and B, if people are like, you know, they sat on it the way that they were supposed to, because I think it, one of our original design sort of looked the same on the front and the back. Um, and one of the, the issues with that, particularly for the, the type of waste management that we were trying to design around, uh, it was waste separating. So urine was going one way, feces was going another way. Oh, and so if you sat on it wrong, you'd have a problem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so we were like, we need to make sure that in the event that that's like the waste management, you know, preference in the community that people are, you know, sitting on it correctly. And that, that that's is such a good, this is such time. a good thing because so often when, when something gets manufactured or we work with engineering and manufacturing, like it, the, the making commons, you know, whole patterns, doing things, and sometimes doing something asymmetric is actually what's needed so that the use is obvious to things. We've learned that over time that we have sometimes we so, make products that get assembled wrong because right. the whole pattern was even because that was easier to just yeah. engineer and You're plan. You're able to install a part 180 degrees either way and and so as Tracy said we would plan it so that there's only one way it would go together and it's yes. the right way so it yep. seems you're you're you discovering the same thing some yeah. similar yeah. situations yeah, yeah. yeah. now Tom had asked about what type of 3d printers um what did you have access to a lab at Georgia Tech or did you work with an outside makerspace how did you do that yeah, so we um, we did have access to 3D printing at Georgia Tech, and so that was sort of the main methodology. There's the digital fabrication lab at Georgia Tech as well. Um, in addition to you know the like, small maker box that we were using, we also continued uh, using foam uh, cutter machines um, to actually uh, kind of get real size pieces to see if you know the the 3D print would tell us if the snap fits were working, um, and then the foam full size models were telling us like if is this is actually kind of meeting where we think it's going to meet on the human body um, to give us that full scale um, toilet experience without <laughs> having to spend all the money on the full manufactured product yet. Well, pretty um, soon maybe so they'll have VR to add in there and then in the labs and then you won't even, you, you can go pretend to sit in it. So. Yeah, yeah, that would be incredible. <laughs> and I mean, I think, yeah, just moving more, you know, in line with some of these, like, I guess, like fourth industrial revolution sort of technologies. I mean, you know, we, CNC a lot right now. Um, I think that's been sort of our next generation uh, prototyping is as we sort of started to uh, pilot full scale toilet prototypes, we uh, wanted to like do, do it rel relatively rapidly. Um, the cost is high um, because I mean, that's the nature of the beast, but we didn't want to invest in the, you know, the molds for injection you know, injection manufacturing without proving that that's, you know, what the market smart. wants. Oh, that Please makes smart. I'm so glad sense. you said so, that. <laughs> so you were machining uh, some prototypes at some point out of solid plastic and putting them together, it sounds like? Yes. Yeah. And so the, the CNC um, group that we're working with right now, they're based out of China. Um, so, I mean, I know there's been some changes uh, with working with China right now, just in light of um, the realities of the world, but we were working with them last year. They, their process has been sort of um, like a series, it, it, it's kind of like uh, piecemeal, sort of like a puzzle where, you know, each layer sort of fits together. So it's not a full plastic um, yeah. mold. Yeah. It, it's kind of like pieces together, but it, like the structural integrity is 
uh, as it would be if it was a full um, plastic. Sure, they're That's just great. making it out of smaller pieces. The, yeah. We've done that in a lot in China too. They do that because they don't want to waste material more than anything. Material yeah. is more expensive for them than labor. So to make something out of multiple pieces and glue it together permanently or somehow otherwise the join parts makes total sense. <laughs> yeah. Um, you could, with a, the right kind of 3D printer, large enough, you probably could 3D print the whole thing or it's different modular pieces. But I know if you didn't have access to that, that might not be the, the path you took. So well, what, yeah. what's the biggest challenge for you right now? So, I mean, obviously we're just mentioning that working with China has been difficult and it is difficult for many companies and in various industries. Um, and there's a supply chain problem in terms of materials too, um, yeah. recycled materials, especially. So, you know, what is the biggest challenge for you right now in terms of getting this to the market that you want and getting it to, into a position where this thing can be made and used. Yes, yeah. So um, we're in a place now where we're we're we sort of been uh, figuring out a number of things. So we, again, we like know that it works. We know that people like using it, and we've done testing in the U.S. And um, I also lived in Zambia, so we did some additional tests uh, in 2015, 2016 in Zambia. Um, and there's an interesting market demand there as well that we potentially could help fill. Uh, but there's this question, particularly in some of, you know, in a like, you know, Zambian market, kind of this willingness to pay component. Um, so we've sort of figured out like if, before we invest in, you know, large scale manufacturing, we need to make sure that people like there's there's a there's an actual <laughs> willingness to pay. Like people have said, you know, we would definitely pay twenty five dollars for this toilet seat or we definitely pay, you know, fifty dollars. But we've not actually seen a transaction for a lot of these particularly lower income uh, we You're talk about that. <laughs> yeah we talk about this all the time phrase. yeah Go so, ahead, say it. yeah it's it that called? market proof there you go. right yeah. so yep. market proof isn't just that the market will use it right that it's like oh they we like it we'll we'll try it it's that they will plunk down a dollar for it or whatever the amount of money is because that's true market proof that it's viable and and worth investing in the tooling that you need and yes. in the inventory that you need and going forward. So achieving that is one of the hardest things. So that the fact that you're at that stage and you're doing it though, before you have like stocks of inventory in your yes. warehouse somewhere, right? Especially when it's that big, right. um, you know, that's a really smart strategy. So I'm so glad that's the stage that you're at, but it is also the most critical one. And so yeah. by the fact that you've identified a specific market that can pay and will pay, yeah. that's really, a, really an interesting model as well. And so thinking that brings to me the other idea of, of thinking about if you've got a sort of more affluent community who is willing to pay and buy, there might be a, a buy one, give one right in the future model for you because yeah. you do have the nonprofit arm too. So or like there buy could be one that was that higher level hooked up to sanitation. That's yeah. the more status level. And then you'll give away one that's an aspiring person to be right. there, right? That has yeah. More so I love that. Need. So you've left yourself open to having that strategy, which is going to be great for investment as you go forward. Well, and also one other thing I'd like to suggest you consider if you haven't already is that, let's say you you I mean because I imagine obviously you have a lot of passion about this project. There are probably certain philanthropic organizations or individuals who would be interested to also contribute and help maybe they have the same fear of not wanting to invest in it until you can prove people are going to pay the money for it fine but in a limited way you could get a smaller amount of money put out a limited series of 20 toilets right make 20 and you're going to spend more on them than you're going to make right. by selling them but you're going to get the proof that the market is willing to pay that $25 or $50 or whatever it is. It doesn't matter that you spent $200 on each one, right? Or whatever it ends up being. You're, it, this is an investment in proving there is a market for a bigger investment dollar yeah, if I that's had this, make it affordable. Yeah, if I had this, I can make it for this and that's profitable, but I don't necessarily have to make money from my first one. And I think that's a that's a mistake that many inventors and, and, and uh, product designers make is that they think that it has to be made from day one. But market proof, you'll spend a load of money on marketing later, like 10 to 20 times more if you get it wrong. Right. So, you know, getting it right from the beginning is worth that extra spend. So yeah. I, I, I love that you're at that stage. And, you know, it comes to think that there's got to be, oh, um, gender equity is a very big conversation. 
right? And, and it's gotten bigger since you first were introduced to this idea. So there's got to be much more organizations and you've worked on a collaborative model all along. How have you found that as working with other organizations to sort of tap into that? Yeah, no, I mean, I think, um, yeah, you all sort of like reinforce our, our thinking. So I really appreciate that. I mean, Good. Um, it is, it is, I will say it is sort of um, daunting when our competitor in a lot of these markets are sort of free, um, like free toilets are like the competitor that we're competing against. But I mean, in terms of aspirational value, that's something that we, yeah, we want to prove that uh, and we need to prove it before we invest um, in next steps. And I think um, the narrative though, about like the actual product and how it, um, is intuitive and it is something, you know, for our, our pilot in Zambia, we worked with a female headed household. She was relatively, um, you know, older and she was like, this is amazing that we, you know, I can upgrade my toilet. I can, you know, install the seat. I can, you know, make it into a sit toilet or I can change it to a squat toilet on my own without having to call someone to help me uh, because it's like, you know, just like a snap fit. It's not something that requires like, in, you know, intense uh, knowledge about, you know, in toilet installation. I think that, empowerment, <laughs> that empowerment too is like a, a really good component, especially when we're working with organizations that are in the gender equity space. So I've done some work with Women Deliver. They, you know, work on uh, uh, gender equality work around the world. Um, and it is, you know, a good, you know, value add when we talk about how this product is intuitive for all people and how it's easy for all people. Um, and I think particularly for women as, you know, in a lot of you know, context, women are often in charge of a lot of the bathroom norms in terms of cleaning, in terms of what's happening in the household. And if it's something that the woman feels like she can manage and, you know, maintain and install and do whatever on her own, that makes it even, you know, a, a better buy-in for the community and for sustainability um, and for, you know, ownership and pride and all these things too that I think are really important to address. So um, yeah, I would definitely- so You've built a whole process around actually reinforcing the thing that you were first inspired by. And I, I you know, like uh, balancing and reshifting the equity of, yeah. of, you know, gender norms across the world. I love that, that, you know, did you ever think that as you got started here that this would be the case? you know, that you'd still be working on this from the moment you started it? Oh man, um, I don't think so. I mean, but for me, <laughs> for me, it's just like every, every day is like a new adventure. I feel like sanitation, there's, it literally, it touches everybody <laughs> and every, you know, everyone, no matter who you are, where you're from, you know, what your background is, what you believe, like sanitation is like a universal experience for everyone. And so I think that that to me is such a cool part of it is that, people resonate with it. People are like, yes, like it really, it, it sucks when you don't know where to go to the bathroom and you like need to go like right now. And like that feeling is like a universal understanding. And I think um, that empathy that comes from that and that understanding that, you know, if you've ever used a really nasty toilet, like that feeling of disgust, again, is like a universal feeling. So I think as I have started like diving further into the space, it's like such an exciting world to be in. And now with, you know, COVID is, you know, changing the landscape of a lot of things, but COVID is a, like water sanitation and hygiene related disease. And so the nature of the sector as it relates to public health, like there's so many interesting implications that, you know, the world is going to move towards. Um, there's some interesting things with smart sanitation, like how, how might we use biosensors in like toilet technologies to be, you know, preventative health diagnostic tools. Well, and I think right now you're right about that. It's like, you know, we have this issue. So we, you know, we're in Orange County, California, which is south of LA, but there's uh, problems all the way up the coast here with um, a homeless population. Right. And it yeah. is a sanitation problem that each mayor of each city around here is struggling to, to figure out a solution for. Yep. Uh, and safe think, and clean solution. So you're, you're right. It's it, it's not just somewhere around the world that I'm not I'm not familiar with, right? It, it is in our backyard as well. Yes. Yeah. And I know I think that that is a really important point because I think oftentimes people are like, oh yeah, like go somewhere else and like do the great work. But it's like, we have some stuff we can fix here too. And when we look at products, like just the product of toilets, you know, the diversity of things like, you know, toothbrushes or chairs. And then we look at toilets and it's like, there's only a limited number of product designs that exist. Like there's a need to disrupt that or like kind of dig into that more. Like, even if we're just looking at everything, you know, the general population, like there's not a lot of innovation that exists in the space that I'm- Well, that's what with. I was just thinking here. I was thinking like the mayors almost need to tum talk to you because 
is while your product may not be the perfect application, what you've learned is, which is that it's human behavior, it's um, the women in those communities who need a more privacy that makes it more difficult. Like, so you, what you've learned about the social inequity, that is also a big player in it. And it's why you can't just take a toilet and just say, hey, we put some in over here. Right. go use them. Right. That's why it's not working. Yeah. And so that's a, you know, that's a really interesting model. I think your wish for wash has a bigger, broader, you know, future ahead of it. Uh, you know, I hope that doesn't feel daunting. I hope that still keeps you energized as yeah, you go forward yeah, because no, so you good. have just as much energy as when I interviewed you two years ago. In fact, <laughs> I think you're even more excited now. So. Yes. Yeah. No, I'm so glad to be here and to reflect on the journey since then. And hopefully kind of future past, like where we're continue, continuing to go. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that there's, there is so much opportunity in terms of design, in terms of manufacturing, in terms of access, innovation at large. Like, I think there's so much that could be done. Um, and so I think that, again, like my sort of um, heart for a lot of this now is like, how, how can we get more creatives? How might we get more, you know, engineers, designers into the space that think this way and not not thinking like, let's just do what we've been doing. Let's think about something new and how we can address a lot of these problems that exist. Well, I, we have listeners out there who are all in those creative worlds and in those in those fields. So they are always excited to tackle new problems and, and new uh, issues and, and get excited about things. So I hope that we do that here. But is there anything else? And you know, we'll of course have links for everything and how to connect up with Wish for Wash and Jasmine Burton. And we'll have all of that in the blog post for this episode. But what can our listeners do to help you and your mission? Yes. Yeah, no. Um, so we have a, a number of things. Um, so for our nonprofit arm, um, we uh, do a series of uh, community-based education initiatives where we use basically design thinking. Uh, we call them design jams. Um, so like two to three hour workshops talking about sanitation in our community and how we can use design thinking to help address it, to just unlock people's thinking. Um, so that's, that's an opportunity to plug in. We also have a fun coloring book if anyone's interested. Everybody picks coloring book. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, we're so totally getting those for our girls. <laughs> our kids would love that. Um, so educational and fun for people of all ages. Yeah, and then also in terms of, again, going back to the, the market viability. Um, so we are in this place now where we're looking um, to secure funding um, for, for, you know, 10 to 20 pilot you know, run uh, for a market viability test. So I think supporting in that way would be incredible as well. Uh, but yeah, also just, you know, in, you know, subscribing to our newsletter, letting us know if you're interested in, in collaborating. We're always looking for partners. Um, but yeah, we're really excited to continue growing, you know, in, in our, you know, product design area, but also in our education and research. Um, right now, we're also um, kind of looking to, to publish some papers about like what it looks like to use design thinking in the sanitation space as sort of a, a, a new framework, hopefully, that will hopefully transcend beyond us and kind of make further implications and impacts in the world. Um, so yeah, those are, those are some ways to plug in. Well, wonderful. We'll make sure everybody can connect up with you and help your mission at Wish for Wash. Jasmine Burton, thank you so much for joining us today and, and congratulations on getting as far as you have in this. And I look forward to seeing what happens in the next two years for you as well. Yes. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Wow. Yeah. Wow. For sure. <laughs> you know, Tracy, so many things to think about and, and consider and, and discuss about that interview. And one of the things that I really uh, respect and relate to, honestly, is how, you know, this started as a student project at Georgia Tech University in this industrial design department. And I think anybody who's been through a program like that or is involved in education in a program like that knows that sometimes students choose a subject for a project that is really bigger than they are and might be getting in over their heads. And that sounds I, like a jaded designer view. I might add. Well, no, no, I mean, <laughs> but it, it is. happens. Yeah. It happens all the time. And I have to say, I mean, Jasmine probably didn't realize that she was diving into the deep end of a very, very large Olympic sized swimming pool, maybe even, you know, two or three times Olympic sized swimming pool with this project, Ocean which, size. which <laughs> she could have, just approached it from one perspective and not really gone full tilt into the whole project. It could have just been a student project that was, you know, a nice aspirational thing and, you know, you get your grade and you move on and, and you don't really do it again. You go get a job in whatever the real world here in the United States is and leave it. But no, I mean, she 
really went all in and I think came to realize the project is so much bigger than she first realized, but she's didn't taken that on as a challenge. It's like, okay, so there's more to it. Let's figure out what that is and let's consider everything and come up with a, the best solution possible given all the considerations. That's but, admirable. You know, I really also just want to hire, uh, want to highlight Georgia Tech in creating a model for inspiration within their community because not only did they inspire her, but they knew how to nurture it. Their adventure program, which is this award ceremony, and it, and it brings money and vitality and mentorship into that process for them. You know, really gave them that the view of what it was going to take for them to kind of dive deeper into this. So, you know, the fact that she worked. In partnership that she has partners that she's collaborating on a constant basis that that's more real world what it's like to be out there as a designer right and it's you know this interaction between um, the technology isn't all the engineering skills and the engineering knowledge isn't all that it's going to take it's knowledge of how to communicate with people how to communicate your ideas and how to get research and get information back and and how to go about and then translate that into the next model and how to do things like digitally manufacture and, and, you know, utilize all the tools and find resources and helpers in that process, whether it's co corporations or as vendors or whatever it might be in the process of that. So the fact that they created this environment where that could nurture that and, and teach her that and provide access to that along the way, that's really admirable. And I, you know, always thought Georgia Tech was a great school. We used to live in South Carolina and always, I was always really impressed with the grads I met from that area. And, um, but now, I see why like I see what that is and but I really think sometimes that we as designers get an inspiration point Tom you know we get something that goes like that sounds like really cool like I'd really like to tackle you know as we talked about it PE right you know personal equipment for all, the, all of what's going on in COVID and health but we really don't until we start diving into that realize we're opening this can of worms we aren't just making a face mask right we're now making it something that has to go through approvals it has to go through durability it has to be comfortable. It has to be able to be put on easily. It has to safely protect. Like we don't realize the can of worms. We just, we hear something that excites us and we dive in. So I think you're so right about like that. And then too often you're like, okay, that was way over more than I well, thought I was going to be. I'm, you know, and you don't take it forward. Right. And, and it really highlights the difference, Tracy, between an idea and a you know, a design or a project or a product. I mean, you know, I've had, can't tell you how Or a mission. People, well, <laughs> right. you, know, you know, often I've had like the father of a lifelong friend of mine say, hey, Tom, I had an idea for you. Because he knows I've got patents and things. He's like, Tom, you need to do this. You, it, you know, why hasn't it, you, somebody should have done it. You should do it. And he, they just, somebody like that has no perspective on how you, in order to really do it right, would have to throw yourself into it. And that's really what Jasmine's done here. She's like, hey, toilets have been around for centuries here. And if we're going to reinvent this wheel, so to speak, it's a serious project that it deserves that kind of passion, dedication, attention, and focus. Well, you know, that's, that's what really actually, you know, in a way, Jasmine sent me an email and it just ironically was right after we had seen the, the docu-series uh, Inside Bill's Brain, which is about Bill Gates. Um, and they talk about in that series about their sort of toilet, a world toilet initiative. I forget what yeah, they call it. I forget it. what it's called too, but yeah. it's a project that was to, you know, create a new toilet, especially for underdeveloped communities that didn't need water. I think it's a waterless toilet, isn't it? It, it was supposed to be waterless. Yeah. Mm. Anyway, they, they had criteria and they had a whole mission and program around it. But the interesting part was that um, what sparked their conversation and their decision to get involved in it from Bill, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation was that Melinda had been reading an article that was in the I don't I in the I think New York, it was New York Times magazine or New, something. Yeah, New York Times magazine. Maybe. And she read this article that was written by by a journalist and it was talking about this you know, world sanitation problem, what it was creating, this gender equity problem, and it was creating all kinds of educational problems. And that was part of their mission. So it was creating a health, sanitation, educational problem. And so it fit within the mission that they had as an organization. So when they read it, they said, 
wow, we can do something about this. This is complex. It requires focus. It requires investment. It requires collaboration. And we can do something about that. So I thought that was like a really interesting model to take. And I think that really ties to, you know, what Jasmine has done here and, and what the, the community of workers and, and mission people surrounding her, her community that she's developed for Wish for Wash, that they all have that same kind of passion and excitement. And so while they didn't have the, you know, broader ability to have what the foundation had, they certainly had created it for themselves within their community, within the people that they invited in and the people that they worked with. And they created that mini ecosystem for themselves to help it grow. Now, is it growing fast enough? No, right? That's why everyone else needs to get involved and why we're going to have all the um, ways to connect and support their organization, Wish for Wash. We'll have that in the blog post for this episode at 3D Start Point. And, you know, it's also why I think I've been so impressed with everything in the series from HP is that they look at those things as a bigger um, mission. So whether it's on the education front or it's on, uh, we want to create um, access to digital manufacturing. We want to create access to that for communities that are disenfranchised or remote, right? And so we want to create those kinds of things that they've been looking at that from a, we have ability, we have uh, the opportunity to bring in collaborators in the process. We can get access into the lar the higher part of the communities so we can get into the, the organizational structures of the, of the government or we can get into it for the university level and we can affect change from that top down and we can affect change from, a, 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 you know, getting funding and missions and, and, and bringing awareness to that as well. And so when they're looking at doing it, that I think has been the differentiator to me. And it's like, we can sit back as designers and have great ideas and great missions about what we want to create in the world and the change we want to make in the world. But if we don't reach outside of ourselves, if we don't reach and start to collaborate with others and look at it as a collaboration instead of a competition, then we're actually not going to make the, the bigger, broader changes we need in the world. And Jasmine Burton and Wish for Wash has learned that really early on. And uh, that's, I think, why they have the ability to make so much good change in the world. I agree with you, Tracy. And, and don't forget, there's also some videos and pictures. Oh, of gosh, Jasmine's yeah. She sent us, she she sent us process pictures, some sketches, some other right. things, and videos of various things. So we have lots of links to it. I'll link also, of course, to that article that I wrote as well will be linked in this episode. So we'll make sure that you get all of that if you go to 3dstartpoint.com. And as always, if you go to 3dstartpoint.com forward slash HP, if you want to go back through, you'll be able to see the listing of the episodes because we're now at, at number 24. So we're almost done with our series. And so you'll be able to see all of them there and sort of be able to pick and choose or go all the way from the beginning and make sure you're hitting the entire series in order because we planned it really specifically for you to sort of lead up to where we are right now. And, and upcoming, we're going to talk about our own experience using the, the MGF, MJF printers and with our own projects, which we've never gotten to test before in the history of this podcast. So that's going to be fun. And that comes up next. All right. Well, I sure hope you enjoyed this episode as much as we did. It was a real pleasure to do. So we'll be back soon for another episode. So this is Tracy Hazard and Tom Hazard on WTFFF. Thanks for listening to the WTFFF special series brought to you by the Z and 3D print teams from HP. You can access all the resources mentioned in this episode and all the other episodes in this series by going to 3dstartpoint.com slash HP. We invite you to reach out to us on social at 3D Startpoint and at Z by HP and let us know what you are creating in 3D.